doing some kind of biomedical project. Well, maybe she could redesign a lighter, more versatile fluid. So this is the mold, and we printed one of these. I'd always kind of wanted to be a doctor, wanted to discover biomedical engineering. I was like, well, that's the perfect combination of medical and engineering. The whole foot together weighs two and a half pounds. Ideally, we would like to get it within 1.7 pounds. Yeah, that sounds great. Once we got the prosthetic from Kendall, we had crazy ideas. We took the whole foot apart and modeled the original prosthetic in semen software. And I'm just gonna draw two holes there real fast. Solid Edge lets me design and test the foot before we ever actually build it. We tell it a few things that we need, and then it takes all that information and it decides what's going to maximize the strength and minimize the weight to create a part that would be the lowest weight possible for Kendall. This has taken almost a year to the day. I don't think this has ever been done by a 17-year-old girl before. There you go. Awesome. It feels strong. It feels sturdy. It does feel a lot lighter. Nerds rule the world. Nerds got us to the moon. Nerds are doing things with prosthetics that I have never dreamed of doing. And go. Having a lighter foot is going to open up possibilities that would not have been there before. You know, the more kids that uh, can learn this stuff at earlier ages, they can go on to create new and better things that we're not even dreaming of right now. It's amazing. In the future, I want to do the things that are impossible right now. If I can design this prosthetic now, I can't wait to see what I will design in the future. I've always been an active person. I've always enjoyed the outdoors. When I was a little kid, the mountain was my playground. It's always gonna be a passion for me. I was an infantry assaultman in the Marine Corps. I was shot in Afghanistan in 2012. Those injuries left me partially paralyzed and I decided to electively amputate my leg. I have a pretty heavy duty foot. It allows me to be very active, but at the same time, it's a bit heavy. Anything that requires more energy really just fatigues me faster. I live in a nerd town. Huntsville is the hub of engineering in Alabama. We have so many new career tech programs like advanced manufacturing and engineering right in our high school. Reset the clamp, a little bit tighter. My brother started a school initiative for engineering and he had a student who was really interested in doing some kind of biomedical project. Well, maybe she could redesign a lighter, more versatile foot. So this is the mold, and we printed one of these. I'd always kind of wanted to be a doctor, wanted to discover biomedical engineering. I was like, well, that's the perfect combination of medical and engineering. The whole foot together weighs two and a half pounds. Ideally, we would like to get it within 1.7 pounds. Yeah, that sounds great. Once we got the prosthetic from Kendall, we had crazy ideas. We took the whole foot apart and modeled the original prosthetic in semen software. And I'm just gonna draw two holes there real fast. Solid Edge lets me design and test the foot before we ever actually build it. We tell it a few things that we need, and then it takes all that information and it decides what's going to maximize the strength and minimize the weight to create a part that would be the lowest weight possible for Kendall. This has taken almost a year to the day. I don't think this has ever been done by a 17-year-old girl before. There you go. Awesome. It feels strong. It feels sturdy. It does feel a lot lighter. Nerds rule the world. Nerds got us to the moon. Nerds are doing things with prosthetics that I have never dreamed of doing. And go. Having a lighter foot is going to open up possibilities that would not have been there before. You know, the more kids that uh, can learn this stuff at earlier ages, they can go on to create new and better things that we're not even dreaming of right now. It's amazing. In the future, I want to do the things that are impossible right now. If I can design this prosthetic now, I can't wait to see what I will design in the future. I've always been an active person. I've always enjoyed the outdoors. When I was a little kid, the mountain was my playground. It's always gonna be a passion for me. I was an infantry assaultman in the Marine Corps. I was shot in Afghanistan in 2012. Those injuries left me partially paralyzed and I decided to electively amputate my leg. I have a pretty heavy duty foot. It allows me to be very active, but at the same time, it's a bit heavy. Anything that requires more energy really just fatigues me faster. 
I live in a nerd town. Huntsville is the hub of engineering in Alabama. We have so many new career tech programs like advanced manufacturing and engineering right in our high school. Reset the clamp, a little bit tighter. My brother started a school initiative for engineering and he had a student who was really interested in doing some kind of biomedical project. Well, maybe she could redesign a lighter, more versatile foot. So this is the mold and we printed one of these. I'd always kind of wanted to be a doctor. When I discovered biomedical engineering, I was like, well, that's the perfect combination of medical and engineering. The whole foot together weighs two and a half pounds. Ideally, we would like to get it within 1.7 pounds. Yeah, that sounds great. Once we got the prosthetic from Kendall, we had crazy ideas. We took the whole foot apart and modeled the original prosthetic in Siemens software. And I'm just gonna draw two holes there real fast. Solid Edge lets me design and test the foot before we ever actually build it. We tell it a few things that we need, and then it takes all that information and it decides what's going to maximize the strength and minimize the weight to create a part that would be the lowest weight possible for Kendall. This has taken almost a year to the day. I don't think this has ever been done by a 17-year-old girl before. There you go. Awesome. It feels strong. It feels sturdy. It does feel a lot lighter. Nerds rule the world. Nerds got us to the moon. Nerds are doing things with prosthetics that I have never dreamed of doing. And go. Having a lighter foot is going to open up possibilities that would not have been there before. You know, the more kids that uh, can learn this stuff at earlier ages, they can go on to create new and better things that we're not even dreaming of right now. It's amazing. In the future, I want to do the things that are impossible right now. If I can design this prosthetic now, I can't wait to see what I will design in the future. I've always been an active person. I've always enjoyed the outdoors. When I was a little kid, the mountain was my playground. It's always gonna be a passion for me. I was an infantry assaultman in the Marine Corps. I was shot in Afghanistan in 2012. Those injuries left me partially paralyzed and I decided to electively amputate my leg. I have a pretty heavy duty foot. It allows me to be very active, but at the same time, it's a bit heavy. Anything that requires more energy really just fatigues me faster. I live in a nerd town. Huntsville is the hub of engineering in Alabama. We have so many new career tech programs like advanced manufacturing and engineering right in our high school. Reset the clamp, a little bit tighter. My brother started a school initiative for engineering and he had a student who was really interested in doing some kind of biomedical project. Well, maybe she could redesign a lighter, more versatile foot. So this is the mold, and we printed one of these. I'd always kind of wanted to be a doctor. When I discovered biomedical engineering, I was like, well, that's the perfect combination of medical and engineering. The whole foot together weighs two and a half pounds. Ideally, we would like to get it within 1.7 pounds. Yeah, that sounds great. Once we got the prosthetic from Kendall, we had crazy ideas. We took the whole foot apart and modeled the original prosthetic in Siemens software. And I'm just gonna draw two holes there real fast. Solid Edge lets me design and test the foot before we ever actually build it. We tell it a few things that we need, and then it takes all that information and it decides what's going to maximize the strength and minimize the weight to create a part that would be the lowest weight possible for Kendall. This has taken almost a year to the day. I don't think this has ever been done by a 17-year-old girl before. There you go. Awesome. It feels strong. It feels sturdy. It does feel a lot lighter. Nerds rule the world. Nerds got us to the moon. Nerds are doing things with prosthetics that I have never dreamed of doing. And go. Having a lighter foot is going to open up possibilities that would not have been there before. You know, the more kids that uh, can learn this stuff at earlier ages, they can go on to create new and better things that we're not even dreaming of right now. It's amazing. In the future, I want to do the things that are impossible right now. If I can design this prosthetic now, I can't wait to see what I will design in the future. I've always been an active person. I've always enjoyed the outdoors. When I was a little kid, the mountain was my playground. It's always gonna be a passion for me. I was an infantry assaultman in the Marine Corps. 
since I was shot in Afghanistan in 2012. Those injuries left me partially paralyzed, and I decided to electively amputate my leg. I have a pretty heavy-duty foot. It allows me to be very active, but at the same time, it's a bit heavy. Anything that requires more energy really just fatigues me faster. I live in a nerd town. Huntsville is the hub of engineering in Alabama. We have so many new career tech programs, like advanced manufacturing and engineering right in our high school. Reset the clamp, a little bit tighter. My brother started a school initiative for engineering, and he had a student who was really interested in doing some kind of biomedical project. Well, maybe she could redesign a lighter, more versatile foot. So this is the mold, and we printed one of these. I'd always kind of wanted to be a doctor. When I discovered biomedical engineering, I was like, well, that's the perfect combination of medical and engineering. The whole foot together weighs two and a half pounds. Ideally, we would like to get it within 1.7 pounds. Yeah, that sounds great. Once we got the prosthetic from Kendall, we had crazy ideas. We took the whole foot apart and modeled the original prosthetic in Siemens software. And I'm just gonna draw two holes there real fast. Solid Edge lets me design and test the foot before we ever actually build it. We tell it a few things that we need, and then it takes all that information and it decides what's going to maximize the strength and minimize the weight to create a part that would be the lowest weight possible for Kendall. This has taken almost a year to the day. I don't think this has ever been done by a 17-year-old girl before. There you go. Awesome. It feels strong. It feels sturdy. It does feel a lot lighter. Nerds rule the world. Nerds got us to the moon. Nerds are doing things with prosthetics that I have never dreamed of doing. And go. Having a lighter foot is going to open up possibilities that would not have been there before. You know, the more kids that uh, can learn this stuff at earlier ages, they can go on to create new and better things that we're not even dreaming of right now. It's amazing. In the future, I want to do the things that are impossible right now. If I can design this prosthetic now, I can't wait to see what I will design in the future. I've always been an active person. I've always enjoyed the outdoors. When I was a little kid, the mountain was my playground. It's always gonna be a passion for me. I was an infantry assault man in the Marine Corps. I was shot in Afghanistan in 2012. Those injuries left me partially paralyzed and I decided to electively amputate my leg. I have a pretty heavy duty foot. It allows me to be very active, but at the same time, it's a bit heavy. Anything that requires more energy really just fatigues me faster. I live in a nerd town. Huntsville is the hub of engineering in Alabama. We have so many new career tech programs, like advanced manufacturing and engineering right in our high school. Reset the clamp, a little bit tighter. My brother started a school initiative for engineering, and he had a student who was really interested in doing some kind of biomedical project. Well, maybe she could redesign a lighter, more versatile foot. So this is the mold, and we printed one of these. I'd always kind of wanted to be a doctor. When I discovered biomedical engineering, I was like, well, that's the perfect combination of medical and engineering. The whole foot together weighs two and a half pounds. Ideally, we would like to get it within 1.7 pounds. Yeah, that sounds great. Once we got the prosthetic from Kendall, we had crazy ideas. We took the whole foot apart and modeled the original prosthetic in Siemens software. And I'm just gonna draw two holes there real fast. Solid Edge lets me design and test the foot before we ever actually build it. We tell it a few things that we need, and then it takes all that information and it decides what's going to maximize the strength and minimize the weight to create a part that would be the lowest weight possible for Kendall. This has taken almost a year to the day. I don't think this has ever been done by a 17-year-old girl before. There you go. Awesome. It feels strong. It feels sturdy. It does feel a lot lighter. Nerds rule the world. Nerds got us to the moon. Nerds are doing things with prosthetics that I have never dreamed of doing. And go. Having a lighter foot is going to open up possibilities that would not have been there before. You know, the more kids that uh, can learn this stuff at earlier ages, they can go on to create new and better things that we're not even dreaming of right now. It's amazing. In the future, I want to do the things that are impossible right now. If I can design this prosthetic now, I can't wait to see what I will design in the future.
I've always been an active person. I've always enjoyed the outdoors. When I was a little kid, the mountain was my playground. It's always gonna be a passion for me. I was an infantry assault man in the Marine Corps. I was shot in Afghanistan in 2012. Those injuries left me partially paralyzed and I decided to electively amputate my leg. I have a pretty heavy duty foot. It allows me to be very active, but at the same time, it's a bit heavy. Anything that requires more energy really just fatigues me faster. I live in a nerd town. Huntsville is the hub of engineering in Alabama. We have so many new career tech programs like advanced manufacturing and engineering right in our high school. Reset the clamp, a little bit tighter. My brother started a school initiative for engineering and he had a student who was really interested in doing some kind of biomedical project. Well, maybe she could redesign a lighter, more versatile foot. So this is the mold and we printed one of these. I'd always kind of wanted to be a doctor. When I discovered biomedical engineering, I was like, well, that's the perfect combination of medical and engineering. The whole foot together weighs two and a half pounds. Ideally, we would like to get it within 1.7 pounds. Yeah, that sounds great. Once we got the prosthetic from Kendall, we had crazy ideas. We took the whole foot apart and modeled the original prosthetic in Siemens software. And I'm just gonna draw two holes there real fast. So all of that lets me design and test the foot before we ever actually build it. We tell it a few things that we need, and then it takes all that information and it decides what's going to maximize the strength and minimize the weight to create a part that would be the lowest weight possible for Kendall. This has taken almost a year to the day. I don't think this has ever been done by a 17-year-old girl before. There you go. Awesome. It feels strong. It feels sturdy. It does feel a lot lighter. Nerds rule the world. Nerds got us to the moon. Nerds are doing things with prosthetics that I have never dreamed of doing. And go. Having a lighter foot is going to open up possibilities that would not have been there before. You know, the more kids that uh, can learn this stuff at earlier ages, they can go on to create new and better things that we're not even dreaming of right now. It's amazing. In the future, I want to do the things that are impossible right now. If I can design this prosthetic now, I can't wait to see what I will design in the future. I've always been an active person. I've always enjoyed the outdoors. When I was a little kid, the mountain was my playground. It's always gonna be a passion for me. I was an infantry assault man in the Marine Corps. I was shot in Afghanistan in 2012. Those injuries left me partially paralyzed and I decided to electively amputate my leg. I have a pretty heavy duty foot. It allows me to be very active, but at the same time, it's a bit heavy. Anything that requires more energy really just fatigues me faster. I live in a nerd town. Huntsville is the hub of engineering in Alabama. We have so many new career tech programs like advanced manufacturing and engineering right in our high school. Reset the clamp, a little bit tighter. My brother started a school initiative for engineering and he had a student who was really interested in doing some kind of biomedical project. Well, maybe she could redesign a lighter, more versatile foot. So this is the mold, and we printed one of these. I'd always kind of wanted to be a doctor. When I discovered biomedical engineering, I was like, well, that's the perfect combination of medical and engineering. The whole foot together weighs two and a half pounds. Ideally, we would like to get it within 1.7 pounds. Yeah, that sounds great. Once we got the prosthetic from Kendall, we had crazy ideas.
you're at a Washington Post live event, it is in front of a live audience. It is online, it's on Facebook, it's Twitter, podcast. This question of what if we are actually alone, um, at least in the, in, the, in the reachable universe through our lifetimes, what does that mean? Post Live provides a forum, it provides a setting for newsmakers to have genuine discussions about important issues. Discussions that can go on for longer than five minutes or a quick cable TV hit. The country is polarized because of the flames of hate that have been fanned. It allows people to get a sense of newsmakers away from the headline. I think it humanizes the news uh, and it humanizes newsmakers. What I know is that my faith in humanity has uh, multiplied by 10. Watching people that had nothing, that had no hope, that had no electricity, no water, the Washington Post is a gateway uh, for conversation. Our job as journalists is to talk to people, explore issues, to ask hard questions, to hold people accountable when their answers don't match up. It's such a good opportunity for these politicians to talk in a way that they can't with reporters even on Capitol Hill. This isn't just grabbing someone in the hallway. This isn't a press conference. So wall money uh, is not a deal breaker for you? Well, when you say wall money, what do you mean? Do you mean well, we're, levies? We're... Do you mean fences? Even Vice President Mike Pence comes to the Washington Post to have a post-live conversation. What we need to do is make sure that um, we provide for the common defense of the people of the United States of America. And um, that's the president's determination here. Newsmakers who, who come here, I would hope that they would know and expect that just because they're sitting in that room with 200 of the most influential people in Washington, if not the country, that their voice and what they're saying will be amplified far beyond the walls here on K Street. Hi everyone, I almost hate to break up the party. <laughs> Sounds great in here. If you don't have a seat, I actually see some up front, so come on, get closer. Uh, my name is Chris Karate. I'm Vice President of Communications here at the Washington Post and General Manager of Washington Post Live. We're so thrilled to have all of you here with us today. Thank you. The debate over corporate responsibility is not new. In the late 1990s, the Influential Business Roundtable defined corporate purpose this way, quote, the paramount duty of management and of boards of directors is to the corporation's stockholders. The interests of other stakeholders are relevant as a derivative of the duty to stockholders. But times have changed. Just a few months ago, the Business Roundtable issued a statement redefining corporate purpose. Signed by 181 CEOs, it seeks more balance in companies' obligations to a diverse array of stakeholders. The companies who signed on committed to a broader mandate than generating profits alone. They pledged to deliver value to their customers and shareholders, of course, but also to deal ethically with suppliers, support and respect their employees and the communities in which they work, and to strive for the long-term health of our economy. Today, we'll talk about what this commitment means for a modern American business and the broader impact it can have on society and the economy. We're uh, very thrilled to have Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan here today. He's gonna talk about how a major corporation puts these principles into practice. We'll also have a discussion with the Business Roundtable executive who spearheaded this initiative. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor of this event, Siemens, as well as our supporting sponsor, the University of Virginia. And I'd now like to welcome to the stage Siemens USA CEO, Barbara Humpton, for some remarks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you to the Washington Post. I've been really looking forward to today's event. You know, as you've just heard, for a long time, there was the Milton Friedman school of thought that the business of business is business. But I ask you now, if you're a company that isn't creating value for society, why do you exist? Business is integral to the fabric of our society, bringing unique resources and skills to the table. 
And that mindset speaks to why Siemens joined those 181 companies on the new purpose statement that the Business Roundtable published earlier this year. A corporate purpose that includes a whole set of stakeholders, from employees to suppliers to the communities in which we serve, aligns with how we run our business. Siemens has been around for 172 years and built a long legacy in industrial manufacturing. And as we've embraced new digital technologies over the past decade, we've reinvented ourselves into the largest industrial software company in the world. We've actually organized our entire business strategy around how our capabilities in software and hardware can solve the world's biggest challenges. Climate change, rapid urbanization, an aging demographic. These are the global megatrends that we're focused on. Nearly half of our revenue comes from our environmental portfolio, helping our customers lower their carbon footprint or helping cities reach their sustainability goals. So you've probably heard that some companies are B2B, business to business. And I know you've heard of B2C, business to consumer. We refer to ourselves as B2S. Our model is business to society. It's not just the right thing to do. I think it's also the core to our longevity, and it's how we'll be contributing 172 years from now. So I'll leave you with this thought before we turn to today's discussion. If we were to appear, if we were to peer into a crystal ball that showed us the marketplace 50 or 100 years from now, what companies would we see? My bet is that those we see will have been rooted in a larger mission. Those that led with purpose to serve society and left our planet better than they found it. That's the business community that I want to help shape. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. And now I'd like to get our um, event started. And welcome to the stage, my colleague, Michael Duffy, with Bank of America CEO, Brian Moynihan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Duffy. I'm an op-ed editor here at The Washington Post, uh, and I'm pleased to be joined by Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America. Thank you for coming, Brian. Thank you. Uh, before we start the conversation, I just want to remind everyone uh, in the room and who may be watching online that you can send us questions at uh, hashtag postlive, and we'll try to get to them on this device they've given me here, which I'm sure I don't know how to operate, uh, before we finish. Um, anyway, on to Brian. Sure. This is, it's great to have you. Thank great you. To be here. Um, we're talking about the Business Roundtable statement. Um, and you have managed through recession and recovery, deregulation and regulation. You run the second or third largest bank in the, in the, in the United States. Um, and you've watched mergers come and go in your category for the last decade. Talk to us a little bit about what the statement means for Bank of America, and if you can, what it means for the country. Sure. I, I think you heard it some of the uh, earlier commentary, but basically, we at Bank of America believe that we have to th drive a thing we call responsible growth. We've got to grow because it, that means we're successful. We've got to do it on a customer focus. We've got to do it with the right risk, and it's got to be sustainable. And this is about being sustainable. This is about producing great returns for shareholders and delivering on what society needs from us. And if you think about the history of banking and how banks came along, um, we came from society up. I mean, we were formed in communities. Our, the oldest part of our bank is the second bank in the United States, formed by some people in 1784, creating a bank. But, and so it, we've had this. And so the BRT was important. The statement, as referenced earlier, uh, there was an old statement that said it was all about shareholder maximization. The team that worked on Alex Gorski and, and, and the colleagues that you hear from later from the BRT realized that we had to move that forward to the way we actually run the companies. And so I think it was important for myself and my colleagues to sign that to show society that we are running these companies across a broader set, set of constituencies. But don't forget, we have to deliver the shareholder returns and do the good works because if we don't deliver the shareholder returns, some other managers can be put in there relatively soon. So, and they may take a different strategy. So these CEOs, I think, were running the companies this way. It codifies it. 
and it makes it an important part of what we do. And it's part of the larger movements going on around the world that we can talk about. Yeah. So you're a company with more than 200,000 employees. Um, and all of us can see that what employees and customers expect in the last decade has sure. evolved quickly. So what does it mean uh, in terms of having responsibility to your uh, cu customers, but also your employees in a way that it didn't perhaps a decade or two ago? Well, one of the things you think about, um, and I'm the chair of the International Business Council, which is under the World Economic Forum, which that group of CEOs assigned like principles, obviously, uh, based on Klaus Schwab's work over the last 40 years, uh, 50 years now. But if you think about the, the basic tenets of thinking about a company and how you drive it, you know, at the end of the day, we, society has told us, we, we have a tagline, what would you like the power to do? That's our new advertising uh, tagline. If you ask the world that, they spoke a few years ago when the SDGs were developed by the United Nations, the Sustainable Development Goals. You asked 100 some countries, 190, whatever it is, they came back and told you. And so we as society have to drive those changes. The problem with it is it costs $6 trillion a year. And charitable giving is about $800 billion a year. That's not going to do it. Mm -mm. If you emptied all the foundations and endowments and everybody says, well, take all the money and just give it to it, that's about a trillion and a half. The U.S. government budget operating wise, $4 trillion. They got to spend some money on some other things. And by the way, they're running a deficit. So where's the money going to come from? It's going to come from aligning capitalism to the SDGs so that you can make money and produce the results and sustain it then. Because then it's a, it ever, you know, like Jim Collins says, the, the flywheel, the flywheel turns and you just keep seeing the activity. What have you learned as you've tried to realign, or maybe not realign, but further align capitalism towards some of these goals uh, at, at Bank of America? What have you, what have you come away the, discovering? The best example might be an environmental space. So if you go back to when we made our first com commitment in environmental, so one of the SDGs, I think a six is the environmental one. If you go back and said what we made in 2000, seven, we committed 25 million, and then we moved it to 50 million when I became CEO. Then I, we moved it to 125 billion, excuse me, not million, billion. And now we just announced 300 billion, which brings us to 450 billion over uh, basically 07 to 2030. So just step and think of that number. Right. So one is, what do we do to achieve that and how we do it? So, one, so we made the environmental commitment, and through financing, we do about $20 billion a year for financing for companies and things, uh, and enterprises to help them make the transition to the new energy future. Uh, that's with all kinds of companies, power companies, um, startup companies, and everything in between. But importantly, it's how we operate. So you start with how we operate. We decided that we would be carbon neutral, and we are carbon neutral by next year, 2020. So you have the whole, a high, the whole bank. The whole bank. And it will have to buy credits, and those credits will go to great, do great projects to create better alternative uh, sources of fuel. But basically, the idea is you're carbon neutral as an operator. Our buildings are LEED Platinum certified. If we can get them there, they're old ones, we have to wait. We gave our teammates uh, a credit for $3,000 to buy a hybrid car. We reduced our own emissions dramatically over the last 20 years, and now we've agreed to be carbon neutral. So it's how you operate, then how you run your business, the financings we do, and then how you actually help research to figure out answers. So we work with universities and others to find research to fund research to help figure out some of these answers, of how, you know, how you can do some things, uh, commercialize some things about sequestration of, of CO2 or things like that. So if you think about all those things, the impact we have, how we operate, how our teammates live and operate, how we use our, our core business principle, and, and by the way, it makes money. And so it's the right thing to do for the shareholders on top of that. You know, somebody said to me, I was interviewing a business leader a few weeks ago, and we were talking about the principles, and uh, he said to me, you know, uh, uh, capitalism needs to change, and if we don't change it, we're going to find out that people who aren't capitalists will change it. Um, does that ring true to you? And, and is it partly because the government isn't moving fast enough uh, to, to address this, or is it also because some of your customers and your employees expect this? Well, you, you, there's a lot of people are talking about capitalism, and a lot of them have names of Gims of B. So Bono, the rock star, will talk about how capitalism needs to be tamed, and Benioff will talk about the capitalism we know is, to, is changed, and, they, and then uh, Warren Buffett will talk about how capitalism is the best system, but you need to have a safety net for those who are going to have the same opportunity due to uh, something, at, not the same education. So the reality is we're talking about opportunity. So it's not capitalism versus socialism. It's more about can you create enterprises like ours that create opportunity for 200,000 plus teammates, the 500,000 family, uh, family members that we ensure and support with, through those teammates, the retirees we support, the communities we give 250 million 
of, of, of charity a year and four and a half billion dollars of low and moderate income housing development. You know, how can you create enterprises which have capitalism align? And that's the key is the alignment of the investors and the operators to drive the change. And so that's what they mean by changing capitalism. But I, I'm not so worried that who's going to define it. I think most of us believe we can do this. Being a leader of a, of a bank like this, particularly one that's at the front lines of this, uh, how is it, uh, they don't teach you in CEO school that you're also going to have to affect global change on a massive scale. So uh, what's it like to wake up every morning and discover that any one of these issues might be uh, front and center uh, at the top of your inbox that day? It, it, you know, you have to listen to your customers and your team and the, and the communities we operate in, and, and they'll tell you that. And so whether, you know, I remember when I first became a corporate strategist, you were taught, we, I wrote my first corporate strategic plan in 1993 or four for a company, and I got you know, chastised because I said, you know, customers, uh, uh, employees, and shareholders, and, I, and the, somebody said to me, no, banks are about communities too. So this is not something new. This is something, literally when I wrote my first strategic plan as a corporate strategist, I had to, I, I, I had to figure it through. So it, it, these are not new concepts, but you, so you don't wake up to it and say, now I'm dealing with this. You basically wake up to, you got a, a, a wonderful business, a wonderful company, a wonderful set of customers, and a wonderful set of communities, serve, and a wonderful set of teammates. And so a lot of times when we think about issues, it comes through the eyes of the teammates. You, you're not gonna be a great employer, you know, you're not going to be the best place for people to work um, if you don't provide great things to them, but also if you don't help them achieve what they want to achieve, which is around these types of issues. We also have to deal with issues you can't expect. I know last year the bank uh, decided to cut off credit for manufacturers of military-style weapons after employees, uh, you know, had asked, uh, had been affected by gun violence themselves. Um, can you see uh, the company taking, the bank taking uh, positions on other issues as they arise? And, and how do you prepare for that since it can come from anywhere at any time? Yeah, I think this is one of the things to be careful. There are issues like that, and there's issues like HB2, which is the law in North Carolina that mm -hmm. got passed uh, that we had to take a firm stand on, that are more about the, um, that are sort of one thing. And then there's business issues and how you run the, uh, the company on, say, the environment or the employee practices. So. On the issues that, like that, the employees, we had about, a, at the time, probably 120 people who were, you know, horribly lost a family member, um, or had a, a family member, husband, wife, et cetera, or a relative in those set settings. Um, and you just sort of, they kept saying, we gotta figure out something we can do. And that was the decision. It wasn't, a, it was more based on that type of thing. Same with HB2, we had employees who were diverse that would not come to the corporate headquarters for the DNI award ceremony because it was scheduled to be there. And they said, we can't have it there because this, this uh, state has passed a law and working with the governor and the legislature, we were able to get that law pulled back and, 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 and change it. So there are a lot driven by the employees. Um, talk one more question about the employees. There's a, a phrase that's in vogue in, 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 in workplaces now that encourages employees to bring their whole selves to work. I suspect as a CEO, you can almost never bring your whole self to work. But talk to us about a little bit about what that like when you have 200,000 employees and um, all the issues that could come up. This is a this is a completely different challenge than the one we, uh, I guess, experienced when we started in the workplace 40 years ago. So I think, you know, I've been the chair of our diversity inclusion council for since 2000, before I CEO, say 2007, I think it was. And one of the issues we had, you had diversity representation statistics. So men, women, people of color, those types, all layers in the organization and how you drive that through. But we really wanted to define what inclusion meant. And, and so we went out and, so, and people started saying, well, let's go out and do research that the council did. And we finally then said, let's just ask people what they want. And so we went out and surveyed our teammates, or select group of them, thousands, and said, what do you, what do you want? And one of our teammates said the way we define inclusion at Bank of America is, said the following, I want to become, be able to come to work every day and come through the door and not leave myself on the outside and have to pick it up on the way home. And that was a simple articulate statement what you're trying to achieve, which is you want people to be able to do all they can do in the company and be themselves at work 
and be able to be successful and never feel to hold back or that's inclusion. That is wholly different than diversity statistics. Right. And, right. and you're seeing people move that. And so I think the travel's been from probably when you and I started in business, uh, or started in things, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you went from you know, just getting the numbers of representation up, but to now it's, okay, you have this diverse group. Are they really working together? Are they really seeing each other? Can they have a courageous conversation of, of, about a subject of disagreement? Remember, at 200,000 people, we have people on both sides of the aisle that think about it. They're all over the world, all over the country. And so they may have a difference of opinion on any issue we take or any issue that's affecting them, but how can they have that courageous conversation? So we'll have a courageous conversation about, after Charlottesville, we had one in the, comp had in the company about the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. We had veterans that had never talked about it, and right. other teammates got to learn about them, and Ken Burns uh, did the film we sponsored. So it's, it's really about getting people to, uh, to have that discussion and have it, and it's, it's, uh, it's it's something we're pretty proud of. I know you talked to a lot of other uh, chief executives and people in the C-suite. Since the, uh, the statement has come out from the round table, as you have uh, met with other CEOs, has there been any reaction that has surprised you? Because uh, I'm sure they talked to you about it, given your role. Is there, has there been a, have you been surprised by the positive reaction? Have you been surprised by the head scratching? Um, anything that uh, after, it's been almost exactly th three months, I guess, yeah. since it was August? I think the big thing that's going on, um, the BRT sort of codified a, a, a redefinition of purpose, and that was terrific. But the big thing that's been going on behind that is actually the movement to the investors and asset owners, the people who invest their money with you know, BlackRock and Larry's letters and things like that that everybody knows about. But the people who invest behind it, mm -hmm. people on our company, their view of what they want companies to do on a rational, important thing. And so that's the big change. And I think what the BRT brought out was more discussion among CEOs that, wait, your shareholders expect this of you. And so we have a unique purview, because remember we had the way we operate the company, but we also had the biggest research, best research platform in the world. And they've done a lot of research that basically will establish that if somebody doesn't score well on ESG, if you went back and looked at the companies that didn't score well and followed them across the last couple of decades, you would be able to avoid 90 plus percent of all the bankruptcies. Mm -hmm. They're still trying to see if it's a true outperformance. Now, ironically, the 181 people assigned the thing of outperform the index in our industry, I actually checked that just to see. So it's good for business. So it's good for business. But the interesting thing is if you can avoid the losers, that's a big deal for an asset manager. And then, so not only is it the right thing to do, and that, that's not a debate, the question is it also helps them which then you can align that capitalism, that, that investor capital, to the companies that are doing the right things, so to speak, around the fullest dimension. And if you get that aligned, everybody will be dragged in. So go back to the environmental one. If we get all the companies in the world to commit their environmentally, um, th that they have a carbon neutral commitment by some year, and that's tough for an oil and gas company, and some have committed to 2050 that they'll be in carbon neutral. Think about the impact that has on consumption and demand for alternative and other sources of power over the next 20, 30 years, if every company, all the major consumers of electricity have scheduled out when they're gonna change. And so you can have triggers that the investors can then look at and get that alignment that will drive them to there. And that's, that's the kinds of things we're thinking about. Right, so while we may think about customers or employees, this is a whole other realm of the, the, the statement because of uh, investors. Because investors have, technology allows you to have, you could walk into our uh, Merrill team or our private bank team and say, I want you know, the S&P 500, but I don't want pick your, pick your stocks. And we can take them out of it and give you the portfolio because technology allows us to do that to, you'd have a big portfolio, but to a relatively small portfolio. And that, that's different. So people can actually almost to the micro level make decisions about you know, ESG funds yes, but and what they're gonna invest in. And so that means the capital's being channeled mm -hmm. against these tasks. So there, therefore you have the interesting and, right? produce great returns and do well, and the investors are gonna invest in companies who do well for their employees, their customers, their shareholders, and their society, and suddenly you have this nice thing that then gets you the six trillion you need. Right, would you call that a hidden impact of the, of the statement? I think it's a hidden impact of the statement, and, and the, it's just, the topic is just more out there, so you hear more people discussing it, and the investors are more clear about what they're expecting, and it's still, it's still coming on. When you have the CEO of the second largest bank in the country, you can't get away without talking a little bit about the economy. Sure. So tell me, what are you seeing right now? Well, in, in the U.S. economy, um, you're seeing basically a, a consumer economy that's very stable, very, you know, from employment, from wage growth, not as fast as we'd like, but growing. You see the spending, and the unique view we have is of, of the spending, so through, you know, January, for the year to date through November 18th, 
the amount of money spent by our consumers is about $2.5 trillion, and that's up 5.8% over last year, same time frame. And it's been consistently rising a little bit during the year, especially in the second, third quarter, and into this quarter. So that bodes well. If the U.S. consumers spend and are employed, that's a good thing for the world's economy. It's a good thing for the U.S. consumer. On the business side, all the things that you all write about every day, whether it's uh, the trade negotiations, whether it's Brexit, whether it's the what's going on here in Washington, all that creates more uncertainty around the business side of the economy, but with a final demand from consumers in the U.S. So we feel very good about the U.S. economy in a sense that it should grow 1.7 next year, 1.7 a year after our early estimates, and be in the low twos this year. Now that's three, down from 3 to 2.3 to 1.7. In the world, we have it about 3.1, and it's much more complex because Europe is still sorting out things in China and India and Brazil and places. But, but the reality is the world is not growing that fast that it, it'll grow in a quarter probably be okay. So we're in the, this is the longest recovery in history. Yep. Yep. Um, is there anything uh, that worries you in particular? And uh, can you just talk a bit about negative interest rates since there's something like 17 trillion in negative debt out there, which I know isn't happening in this country, but you know, talk to us about what that, what the implications of that are, if you can. Well, we don't need negative interest rate in this company because our economy is stronger. I mean, we, that's the thing. We, we, are, we are in kind of a place where we have, you know, Fed funds rate uh, that's, you know, has come down by 75 basis points to be more accommod accommodative to help push the economy forward when you saw some bumping around. But the reason why we have positive interest rates is our economy is growing at 2% plus and other economies of the world are not, and that's why they need negative rates. And so I think it's, it, a lot of people come out a lot of ways, but the reality is that People need those things because they're very unusual and they're in countries that have very difficult growth problems. And so, yes, there's seven trillion of bonds that would theoretically trade with negative rates, but the reality is, is those economies that they're attached to are, are growing at slow rates. And so we should feel good that the U.S. has positive rates. We should feel good that the rate structure is uh, positive. And negative rates have been true in Europe for the last five years. And their economy is basically not is growing less than one percent every year. So, and then in Japan, it's a different story. So the question whether it's a proven strategy, and you're seeing that debate start to emerge, in it, whether it works, for lack of a better term. And so we feel, you know, we feel it's uh, it's not a wise way to go about trying to establish there needs to be fiscal spending, which we're doing a good job in this country. Um, but uh, other countries need to push harder on the fiscal side. Um, uh, there's been a lot written in the last couple of weeks about the prospect of a new kind of competitor out there for banks, um, whether it's a Google or an Amazon or who knows what else are thinking about these platforms. Do those, do you, have you got your eye on those? Do they worry you? I know there was a survey today in American Banker about community bankers being uh, concerned. You're not exactly a community banker, but um, talk to us a little bit about what, what that holds or, and whether you welcome it or worry about it or what. Well, in the end of the day, we look at all competitors and try to figure out what they're doing, what their appeal would be, and what they see in the customer versus what we see. But you really need to step back. At Bank of America today, we have about a, a billion six of consumer interactions a quarter, and a billion five of them are digital today. We have 38 million uh, digital banking customers today. Uh, 30 odd percent of our sales are all digital. So we're a huge, you know, the logins to our website, the mobile uh, banking application, these are huge numbers. So we're already a big digital place, especially on the consumer side where people talk about it. So we study all, whether it's FinTech, small, big or large, what they're doing, thinking about the structure. But I think that the key is that you do step across the line when you have the trust, you have customers' money. And, and so that's why this industry has a set of regulations around it that are not, that are time, uh, these have been going on for years. Before the Fed existed, there was banking regulation. And before the OCC existed, there was banking regulation. So, you know, the idea of uh, regulating uh, banks and stuff. So I think one of the things we have to be careful is with all these competitors that we make sure we don't forget the basic principles. If you take deposits and make loans, society wants regulation around you because you end up with a, a lot of people's money. And, and if something goes, completely, it's a problem. Do you think there'll be a time when there are no sort of brick and mortar banks, that this will all just move into the, into the ether, into the cloud? Um, not if the customers uh, don't change. I mean, we have, so as much as we do all that digitally, yeah. uh, today, you know, by this time tomorrow, 850,000 people come into our branch, uh, the wonderful branches, the wonderful teammates to serve them. What you've seen has changed dramatically is the nature of what goes on at a branch. They're, 
less of them, they're bigger, they have more relationship management, because a lot of the routine tasks 20 years ago where somebody would hand a check for deposit have been taken to the mobile phone or the ATM. And so it, we, the teammates there, you know, and, you know, I need, my mom's sick, I need to figure out how to handle accounts, I need a notary, things are much, I need a home loan, I need a car loan. And so I, I, when I first became a, a strategist I talked about earlier, they, you know, people came in and said, all the bank branches will be gone in 20 years. Well, it's <laughs> more than 20 years, 23, 24 years, and there, we still have 4,100 of them, so they're critically important to structure, but you have to have both. You have to be digitally high touch, high tech, as we call it. Let's go back and finish on the, on the round table on the statement. Um, uh, let me turn the question around a little bit. Uh, was there something that has come out of them and the, um, the, the support by 180 different CEOs that uh, you didn't expect and that you've seen in the first three months, particularly in the, in the, in the way of, a, of initiative or a, um, uh, an application that perhaps even you didn't yeah. and, and the rest of the people well, didn't really anticipate? One, one of the things we've been doing is sharing a lot more what we do. So it, it, you saw sharing what we do as best practice stuff. So what you see around people. And so the, 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 the big di you know, discussion in society now is how do we train people for the next jobs, the fourth industrial revolution, you know, the impact of AI and, uh, uh, and all kinds of technology, which has been true for years. So in 1969, the U.S. had 70 million people working out as 150, and there's a lot of technology deployed during that. So you can do this. The question is what the jobs are going to be. So in our company, we hire about 20, 5,000 people a year. We retrain 17,000 people, so uh, that we get reper uh, you know, retrained in the new jobs and move within the company. We, so I think what you're seeing is uh, just the, the CEOs in the business roundtable and otherwise, you'll see a lot of best practices that are um, displayed around, whether it's on environmental practices, whether it's on employment practice, right. whether on training, whether it's on skills, skill development, pushing for changes in, like in our industry, it's more unique to us than others. We had a restriction that just is getting lifted as we speak of the inability to hire somebody with any kind of criminal past. Uh, you know, people thinking about the check the box, things like that. You're seeing these CEOs seeing that in the context of, of the statement as opposed to a bunch of, you know, a series of one-off initiatives. You also had an announcement a few weeks ago about minimum wage. Yep. Talk to us about that. Well, we, we've... Uh, it was more than a few weeks, actually. Yeah, well, we, we, we've now announced that we, we will have, by next quarter, first quarter 20, we'll be at uh, $20 an hour as the minimum starting wage in the company. And we were going to do that by the next year, but we moved it to year forward. So, How come? Uh, pardon? How come? Uh, it, it really is that we, we, going back to the thing, we, we, we are efficiency ratio is strong, our ability to invest is strong, we want to share the success with our communities and our teammates, and you know, it's, it's the reality of the labor market's tight, that we also have to attract 20,000 people a year, and, and it, it, you need to pay them. And so between that and our benefit structure, you know, our, our living wage equivalent you here talked about is, is like you know, another $15 or $20 for benefits, and we feel very proud of that. So we've gone from basically, uh, over the last, seven, eight years, we've gone up $8 an hour for starting wage and since 2010, I think. A tour de raison in 30 perfect minutes. Thank you, Brian. Uh, that's all that time we have uh, right now. Thanks for coming. Thanks for talking. Thanks for doing also a great job of kind of interviewing himself. I really appreciated that. And thank you all for being here. <laughs> and we'll, be, we'll be right back. <laughs>
and Jill Schlesinger, who's an author and a business analyst with CBS. Thank you all. Great to be here. Right. Um, OK, yeah. so you have to start, since they're kind of yours, right? I mean, you pretty much are the one who put them together. Congratulations. It certainly turned the you know, world on its ear. Um, so tell me, how come you did it? What, why now? And what was sort of the impetus of the, of the, of the statement? Well, I should say um, the CEOs ran this process, which is the way BRT works. Um, the issue really started, our discussion really started in 2018 when a number of corporate critics, um, including your own Stephen Perlstein, um, wrote that our 97 statement on shareholder primacy was the beginning of the end for capitalism. And you know, we thought that was an overstatement, but we had some really candid conversations with the critics. We talked to dozens of corporate governance experts. And most importantly, we talked to our own members. And to a person, our member said, shareholder primacy isn't the way that I try to run my company. That, of course, I want to be generate value for my investors. That's just common sense. Um, but I also want to be a good employer. I want to be a good member of my community. And in fact, in order to return value to shareholders, I have to do all those things. And so their basic view was over the long term, the interests of my various stakeholders converge. Right. You got 180 CEOs to do this. How long did it take you to put that together if you had to sort of bracket the, the process? Oh, you know, I, start to finish was maybe a year. It was 183 CEOs in the end. Um, we started out with just some conversations about what we were trying to accomplish, and the CEOs, um, led by Alex Gorski, um, really kind of weighed in on, on the parameters. We did some drafts and circulated, and they edited those. Um, uh, Alex and Jamie described it to the entire membership, um, and they were on board, and so we, um, so we moved ahead. Daryl, you've been a CEO of Krispy Kreme. You also kind of wrangle, you know, other business leaders now, sort of to the cost. Um, does what Christian say ring true to you? And, and and was there a broader desire to redefine what it means to be? you know, a company and a manager and a, and a steward of uh, these interests. Yeah, I mean, I think the world from, and I think Barb earlier talked about Milton Friedman back in 1970 responding to the 1960s in his statement that the one and only social responsibility of business, quote, within the rules of the game was to increase profits. And I think the rules of the game have changed. You know, 69 of the largest 100 economies in the world are companies. Walmart's bigger, Walmart's revenue every year is bigger than the GDP of 180 countries. I mean, these are enormous inst institutions, and the responsibility has changed. Uh, and expectations of business have really risen over the last number of years. Uh, business trust is, is higher than that of the government, even higher than media, which is kind of hard to imagine. Uh, but you know, trust is up in business, and those expectations are that business can both make a profit and also contribute in positive ways to society. So in many ways, I think this is a reflection of what companies are thinking about. I think particularly big companies uh, and a lot of smaller companies, entrepreneurial companies are thought about it. And I think the opportunity now is how does that extend to other parts of, of, of the market. But I think this is what a lot of companies have been talking about, having those discussions and kind of a changing narrative of the role of business in society. I suspect the statement probably helps with credibility also. I think it does. Certainly there's been pushback on different sides. We've heard about that. That's a good part of the discussion and the narrative. And there's action that now needs to be taken. But it's a, kind of an interesting step in the right direction. Okay. so. Mm. You and I have the hard question, Jill. How do we keep track? Well, how do we monitor the progress? Should, is it our job to monitor the progress of, of these companies as they try to keep up with Kirsten's uh, metrics? Or are there metrics? Is it their job? What, how, do you, how do you come I, at that as a reporter? So from, I'll just play the, let me just be the typecast person as the cynical person who comes from the financial services industry, now in media, and um, really came at this and looked at it, said, well, that's nice, but. And I said the same thing, like, how are we going to hold people accountable? And I think that the challenge is that it, it's all well and good to put this out on paper, but the proof is in the pudding and the actions. So the business roundtable comes out, and this, this, these are great values and very wonderful. And then we see a whole bunch of corporate executives trot off to the desert, suck up to Saudi Arabia, try to get a piece of an IPO of a country where they murdered a United States journalist. And that to me was sort of the quintessential moment where I said to myself, well, not sure exactly how this lines up with these principles. And I feel like when I read these principles, I'm all in 
but I got to see a little bit more action. But should, are we talking about, and you, anybody can answer sure. this one, should we think of this as a five-year window, a 10-year window, I mean, when should we start making judgments? And when you, and maybe you're a good person to ask this of, because yeah. you probably had a time frame in mind. Look, I think it's a process, um, and I don't think there's a sort of one-size-fits-all for any company. I think that the kinds of things that Walmart has to do to invest its, in its employees, it's going to be very different from the kinds of things that Bank of America has to do. Um, for me, the bigger picture isn't the, um, you know, isn't the sort of metrics. It's broadly how can we get corporate America around long-term thinking. So the principle, the theory behind the statement, again, was that over the long term, the interests of various stakeholders converge. That if you're going to be a successful company over the long term, you have to have the trust of your customers, you have to invest in your employees, you have to be a good member of your community, and that doing all those things will help you generate more value for shareholders. And so to me, that's the real question. The, the, the tension for our CEOs isn't really between shareholders and employees, the tension is really between short-term and long-termism. But I mean, is it really that? Because if you look at a whole bunch of folks on Wall Street right now who are preparing for a bad bonus season, they are, you're right, it's short-termism, but what they are unwilling to do is say, you know what, we are not doing a reduction in force, we are keeping everybody on board, and the shareholders are gonna to have to take it on the chin. And they don't make that choice, and they have never made that choice. Look, actually, I think we have lots of examples of companies making, so you know, we have one member who made a decision to raise their minimum wage and lost 21 billion in market value overnight. And again, that was a, question, that was a decision that clearly in their long term to keep them competitive on hiring people and it was clearly something that investors punished them for so to me actually that's the big issue is when companies make those kinds of decisions how do you make sure that investors are bought in that they are participating in the process and this I, th I think it's a fair point first of all companies are like people are gonna make mistakes there's gonna be companies who do that mm -hmm. I think though this statement has really raised a new standard by which you could judge a company and say hey that's not consistent with it I think to expect it to happen overnight is, you know, is, is. But what, do you, let me, what did you think changed from last year to this year where none of them went to the desert, none of them went to that, to Doha in the desert, and this year they went after yeah. this was released? Again, it was a limited number of companies, and I think we can okay. hold those companies accountable okay. appropriately. I do think the short and long-term piece is big, and in our market, particularly Wall Street, is run, you know, quarterly is long term, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a daily kind of a, of, of a place. And I think that's where we're gonna need to see some shift. I mean, even if you go back to Milton Friedman, he talked about increasing profits, increasing over time, not just a one-time hit. And I think this notion of focusing in on, on long-term sustainable value versus short-term gains is a big piece. That's gonna be a big change for Wall Street. It's starting to happen. I know some of the major investors like you know, Vanguard are changing the way people are being incented. That's gonna be a big shift. We know what that's like in our offices are just down the street. It's gonna be a big change. It's not gonna happen overnight. But I do think this notion of companies sharing their long-term plans, what their purpose and values are and something that we're doing at CCP that can provide a context for their short-term behavior. And whether that's an investment into a short-term area, because I'm gonna make money over time, Walmart's the great example. Right? And they have outperformed the market since they did that. Mark Bertolini at Aetna did the same thing. Brian Cornell at Target. They made short-term decisions that many of the traders hated, mm -hmm. but have turned to be good. In fact, if we move from investing toward investing from sort of short-term trading, that may help us in this whole thing. I, I think there's a lot of evidence, actually, that those companies are going to outperform. And, and to me, this, there's a question of kind of everything in the ecosystem that pressures companies to think about short-termism. I mean, some of it is is you know the investors um, sell side analysts who are looking at kind of you know at looking at you know quarterly earnings rather than the big picture i think the media can play a role so this sort of breathless coverage of um, quarterly earnings rather than looking at the you know company's value over the long term so to me there are a lot of things we can bring together to and i don't think this has to be an either or hmm. i think right now the the either has been all about short term and I, so i think it's going to take some while to balance out the you can in the short term is now, those are metrics and milestones along your long-term uh, approach in your sustainable business plan. Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, easy, right? This is, right? The, this is, easy, so, right. This is the best panel I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to ask you, uh, you, may have seen, Jill, you may have seen this all coming, but is there something that's happened since the, um, since the statement came out uh, that has given you reason for uh, optimism? I mean, it's easy to, you know, oh. there are obviously the, the, the corporate world divides into many camps. 
and some companies are just ahead of others here, and some are woefully behind. I, I think that it is great to have the, the, the long-term goal and aspiration. Um, maybe eight or nine years ago, I interviewed Kip Tyndall, who is the CEO of the Container Store, like just all around great guy. And he uh, told me a really funny story. He said, you know, I was with my investment bankers. I was invited to a big conference. And this must have been probably in the 2000s-ish. Yeah. Um, and he said, you know, um, they asked, they were sort of running around the room and asking about shareholders and what we do. And he says, well, you know, I've got three constituencies. I've got my shareholders, I have my employees, and I have my customers. And he goes, and I hear you guys all talking about shareholders, but the way I look at it is my employees come first, they do their job really well, my customers are happy, they shop more, my shareholders are happy. And I want to be a good citizen in my town. And he ran, and he was never invited back. <laughs> and I think that just the change in, say, 15 right. years yep. is pretty awesome. And, um, and I think it's good that it comes from the community. And I think it's great. I'd love to, you know, there are so many things that probably could be on here. And, and so I'm happy that these are here. And I'm here, happy that there are companies like Salesforce are talking about gender pay equality. I'm happy that there are people like Mark Benioff, you know, sort of pushing the needle a little bit. But take up, Daryl, take up Jill's question about what happens when a CEO comes to you and says, this is all great, but, you know, my board and my shareholders are going to kick me out if I don't return a certain profit this year. What do you tell them? Yeah, one of the things we're really encouraging companies to do is to, and actually some of that came from Kip Tindall uh, at the container store. He's also leading an initiative now called Conscious Capitalism. And so we see a lot of this activity happening for small companies. So I think the business roundtable is, is, is great to come with large companies. One of the things we really suggest is to be able to sit down and to craft your long-term plan. This is what Larry Fink has asked for at BlackRock. Very few companies have delivered on it thus far. And we've created a platform. So companies will, will have that. We've had several dozen CEOs share their long-term plans, starts with their corporate purpose, their values, the macro system they're going in. And we've gotten those questions from investors. And I will just note that we have, you know, the investor community is not one community. There's a lot of different groups. Some are very focused in on trading, you know, electronically today, not even sure what company they own. And then there's others who are investing for the long haul. We think a lot of the time and attention and communication has been really with a very short-term oriented. They play an important role in liquidity in the market, but maybe overstated in terms of community, uh, corporate communication. So we've really had these companies, dozens of CEOs, representing nearly three trillion in, uh, in market cap, have shared plans to investors representing 25 trillion plus big numbers in assets under management. And it's really started to create a dialogue. And we think that's gonna be important because it now sets a context and it addresses your significant stakeholders, your material ESG type risks, and it starts to have a dialogue. Now, if you have a tough quarter, here's why we're, we're having that. You have seven or eight tough quarters in a row, maybe it's time to change the plan or change some other things, but at least to provide some, some runway to do it. Some of the tech companies have done a great job on that, and they've been able to really drive incredible value over time without making money. Now, eventually, I think you have to make money, and then how do you continue to, to, to progress that? But I think there are some tools that are emerging now that can really help companies to, to address that. Kristen, one of the critics of the mission statement was um, the sec Treasury Secretary. I'm not sure he's a critic. He was a skeptic, maybe. I don't want to, maybe he was a critic. He said it was <laughs> simplistic. Um, so, and he said, I think he said he wouldn't have signed it, um, although we weren't asking the Treasury Secretary in that <laughs> role to sign it. Uh, so what was he missing? And, and what was that about? And, you know, I think there was some um, misunderstanding from the statement. So when we put it out, we heard, um, you know, there was the high profile criticism from another editorial board, not the Washington Post, that we had put um, shareholders so. below other stakeholders, um, which wasn't true. Actually, we said that if you're going to be a good CEO, you have to be able to do a lot of different things. You can't just generate value for shareholders. You have to do other things as well. Mm -hmm. But of course, we think that it's important to um, to provide a good return on investment for shareholders. And I think the, I think Secretary Mnuchin may have been reflecting that point of view. Um, and I think the other point was maybe some idea that this was kind of a nod. One of the criticisms was that this was an attempt to kind of placate criticisms of, you know, critics of capitalism. And of course, that's not true at all. The statement started with mentioning that a free market economy is that, you know, provides economic growth as a prerequisite to broader economic opportunity. So, so I tend to think it's that, that kind of thinking. I want to get each of your thoughts about the, we talked about this with Brian just for a few minutes, 
where I said, you know, uh, capitalism is certainly a lively conversation these days. And, and someone had, I quoted someone saying that if capitalists don't change it, someone else will. Um, your thoughts about that conversation at the moment, uh, is, it, uh, is, it, is, it, is, is it helping this process? Uh, is it partly perhaps driving this process? Uh, or is it separate? Just I, I'd be interested in hearing from all of you on that. Well, I mean, I think that clearly public, the, the public is frustrated with the system. And um, I think this, the roots are in the financial crisis where trust was eroded. And, um, you know, I always like to describe the financial service. Is there a lot of people here from financial services? I, I presume some, a few, anyway. Um, I always like to describe financial services to me as like a, a beloved drunk aunt. Like, I'm re I, I come from this industry. I've been in it all my life. My first job on Wall Street, I was a trader on the floor of the Commodities Exchange. It's family. Okay, <laughs> it's family. And so when your family misbehaves, you tend to be more critical, right? So when my aunt misbehaves and gets, you know, drunk at Passover, it's embarrassing and horrifying. So when the financial services industry was just so awful in the aftermath of the financial crisis, I think that that really eroded trust for people. I think that there was this sense that, you know, people didn't really understand why banks needed to get bailed out, but people didn't. And that that fomented so much anxiety and so much distrust. And I, I do think this is a good course correct from uh, from that period. And, and I and obviously the conversations around um, the people demanding more of, a corp of corporations and the C-suite to be more responsible to the community, to be more responsible to employees, and to not put making money the number one slash only thing we care about. Right. And I never really think they, that was the only thing, but it sure was a big driver. Right. So I, I think it was coming from there. You agree with the cultural shift? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Um, yeah, I think that what was that great country song at the time? Uh, they're still driving limos in New York town while the rest of the country is burning down. Mm. Right. I mean, it was that was the kind of the environment we're in. But one of the great parts of capitalism is its ability to flex and to change and to innovate and to come up with new ideas and new thoughts. So I think it is really the responsibility of capitalism, which has developed you know, so much of the wealth creation we've had is to evolve as it's gone through. And that's why I think that the statement is so, so powerful. You know, I think for too long, people were using the Milton Friedman statement to basically justify all sorts of questionable short-term behavior. And I think as we have a statement that focuses on sustainable value, over time, we see money moving into index funds um, and out of some of the, the hedge funds and other areas because they perform better over time. And the research is increasingly clear. The companies run for the long term, they take care of their, their, their their employees, their customers, their communities, uh, the planet is, is, is well, uh, they outperform. I mean, they, they do better over time. So this is not like a, an either or, this is an and. Right. Do you want to? You know, we, we feel strongly that free markets, economic freedom, capitalism, whatever you call it, um, is the only system that's going to promote economic growth and innovation and competition and all the things that are that we're going to need in the decades ahead. But obviously, it has to be a system that works for everyone, where you have a fair shot that your hard work is going to get rewarded. And we think that companies have a big role to play in making sure that's true, um, principally by investing in their employees, helping them navigate changes in the economy, investing in their communities. Um, but we'll say government has a role, too, um, that that's got to be part of it. And so part of what we've been doing at Business Roundtable is weighing in on some things that we wouldn't have weighed in on before. So for example, earlier this year, we endorsed an increase in the minimum wage um, because we really think that it hasn't been raised in a long time and that that's got to be part of the puzzle. Um, we've endorsed changes and you know, been calling for changes in the way that um, people get access to financial aid for education to make sure that people have it kind of throughout the course of their career, including mid-career employees have to go back for training. So things like that. Yeah, I think it's hard to underestimate the extent to which the economic crisis that you talked about and the feeling, broader feeling of inequality mm -hmm. has really shifted the expectations, um, particularly uh, among people who are younger um, in a very short period of time. And, it could, and I think a lot of people missed it, but it's, 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 when you really go looking for it in the polls, it's easy to find. Right. And I, th I think we've seen that that's going to continue here as we Absolutely. see money moving from really to, to more women are going to own more assets in the, and to millennials. Right. 
Right. And that's going to make sure we have a real big uh, increase. And with our four millennial daughters, I can assure you, a lot of you know, some money is going their way. Um, and they're just thinking about these issues in some different ways than quick gains. They're looking at, you know, what am I going to be investing in for the for a longer term? Brian, I want to just, uh, I think this one's for you, Christian. The, 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 Brian talked a lot about um, a climate. Uh, and this has been a piece of uh, the statement that has gotten a lot of people's attention. Do you guys provide any um, guidance to companies about how to approach that? Because, a, a, and I think perhaps this may have been some of the administration's objection. Uh, they, they read it and they think, oh, this is about climate. Yeah, I mean, companies are tackling in lots of different ways. We've had lots of companies announcing sort of um, endorsing um, the Paris goals, talking about their role and kind of reducing their carbon emissions and also talking collectively about what position we want to take on both um, climate legislation and kind of sustainability. I think this is absolutely going to be at the kind of heart of what our members want to do in ter terms of pursuing their, um, mm. in pursuing the statement. So I, I, I handed out before we came out here to everybody just a, 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 a copy of this, of the statement mm -hmm. because I told them I was going to ask them a question um, about what piece or line or phrase that they thought would be the most either difficult or controversial or you can interpret the question any way you want, challenging for companies to, to meet. Or, and so I thought I'd just, Jill, you go first. You, you, I'm sure you I never have an opinion. How could you come to me first? Mm -hmm. uh, I, it can just be a few words. You it's going to be a few words. Uh, the second bullet point is uh, investing in our employees. This is starting, this starts with compensating them fairly and providing important benefits. It includes supporting them through training and education, developing new skills, rapidly changing the world. And the last sentence, we foster diversity and inclusion, dignity and respect. Um, I, I think the employee part is really going to be hard. I think that the, I think that, that all these companies have made huge, so I'm a lesbian, I'm out, and I, and I think that the strides that have been made in the last just 10 years are mind blowing to someone like me who came out 100 years ago. But that said, I still think that the employee piece is incredibly difficult. Employees are the first thing that gets cut in the next downturn. And we still have a really big problem getting women representation on boards and in senior levels and senior management in the C-suite. So I think that's the hugest challenge on this list for me. Daryl? Okay. Good, right, two things that came out. One is how do we take this purpose of a corporation as a general statement down to the individual company? How can each company have its own purpose that it can really lead and drive on? And I think we're seeing on a number of issues, while it's not perfect, it is businesses who are really leading more so than partisan politicians mm -hmm. on a lot of these issues, Definitely. really really stepping up climate accord and, and, and uh, you know, rights of, of population and the rest. Right. I think the other one is this notion of really aligning the capital markets. In the capital markets, you know, we have laws built in to make, you know, uh, requiring quarterly reporting and all those. Um, the Wall Street piece, it's been set up for many, many years. Mm -hmm. We've lots of re-engineering, over-engineering the financial markets. And I think that's going to have to change that balance. I think that's going to take time. But when you have signees from the two biggest asset owners in the world, BlackRock and Vanguard, who've signed this, that conversation's happening. It's a discussion. And I think it's that focus there on kind of sustainable value over time versus just short-term gains, I think, is, is going to be an important part. I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit for Kristen, because it's not fair to ask her to critique her <laughs> right, own exactly. stuff. Right. Um, uh, although I'm sure she can do it. So I'll say, uh, what's the, as you look at it now with three months hindsight, what do you think is the biggest lift that you've put at the feet of the people who signed it? And since you've, you know, and what, or alternatively, what is the part that you've seen uh, people rise to the challenge more than, that more than you expected? Um, I think the training. I think the training is a place where they're really, oh, where you really. That. Um, Sorry. So, uh, you know, as Jill was saying, one of the things the statement really talked about is that we have this rapidly changing economy, and part of the responsibility of employers is to help employees navigate that, which, by the way, is also in their business interest because they're going to mm -hmm, need employees mm -hmm. who are um, Kate, who have a whole new skill set, and I and that's where I see our CEOs really animated and excited and incredibly creative. Um, and so I, have, I actually have a lot of optimism in that piece of it. Um, these investments, you know, Amazon is investing, you know, seven hundred million dollars in helping to um, do sort of teach people how to code. 
Walmart is training 600,000 people a year through their academies. They're going to be the largest education provider in the country um, before too long. And so anyway, that's the part where I feel like, you know, I have a kind of a lot, a lot of optimism and enthusiasm about what's ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you guys for coming and listening. This was the best possible briefing you could get on the, on the, on the statement. And we appreciate you uh, coming to hear us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Very good. 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 Was I supposed to tell them what to do next? Um, yeah, actually. Yeah, they're going to give us a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what they're doing. Are you all right? Okay, good, good. Thanks. Thank you. You're all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. That was good fun. You guys are going to stay in touch.